Hello and welcome back to Let's Get Rich with Pattu. Pattu, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. You wanted to share a little bit about what you're hearing from your community. Um, what are you hearing about this podcast? And are you also getting a sense like we are at Offspin that it's slowly finding its feet now that we're on YouTube as well and etc.? Yes, uh, yeah, it's finally the show is getting a lot of traction and um, audio as well as video formats. So many people have thanked um, me for, you know, uh, putting it on YouTube. Of course, the credit goes to the team and I've <laughs> made sure they know that. So a uh, lot of new people, people who do not know anything about me or Free Finkel, uh have also tuned in to the show. And I think that's a, a win for everybody. So yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a great feeling that uh, we're doing something on the right track. All, although we bank very heavily on your audience that you've built so amazingly over the last few years, Pattu, thank you for your audience as well. And thank you to all you listeners who love Pattu and who follow Pattu. And I individually do acknowledge all your feedback. I know we're getting some very pointed feedback about how I interrupt Pattu a lot. And you're listening for Pattu and we should let his train of thought continue. I take this po uh, feedback very positively and I'm constantly questioning myself. I'm asking my team to point it out as well. Working on it. And some positive feedback as well. We thank you all for that. And also the second point, I just, maybe we've not spelt it out, but what we do is we release the podcast in audio on all platforms on a Sunday. And then we release the video version on YouTube and on Spotify on the Thursday that follows that week, right? We just want to see how audio versus video is doing. If you're super, super eager to find out what uh, this week's episode is about and you want to hear the content first, you'll have to do it in audio. And if you have the patience and would like to see Pattu and me on video, then you have to wait till the Thursday of this particular week. So here's how this episode is a little different. And it was entirely Pattu's idea, as usual, fantastic idea. We're getting so much of feedback and questions from all you listeners and, and watchers on YouTube. I have to add that word to listeners as well. We said, why not club it into a QA? and a We're, what, 17, 18 episodes into this entire experiment and journey. Let's start answering users' questions together and dedicate an episode to that. So that's exactly what it is all about. But to thank you for the suggestion, um, viewers and listeners, thank you so much for your questions. Um, and I'll dive straight into it. So I'll structure it, I'll categorize it in a two or three things. There are lots of questions on medical insurance. So perhaps we start on that part too. Um, I'm going to first start with, and full disclaimer, please excuse me for my pronunciation of your names. Uh, there is no ill intent there. I just struggle sometimes with some Indian names. The first one is from Nama Sivayam. Uh, I have a question regarding medical insurance part one episode. Is there any benefit in buying an insurance directly from a good company year after year rather than getting one with the corporate where we work? I specifically want to know about the carry forward benefits for non-used claims in a year slash less hike in premium due to loyalty, etc. Maybe benefits of direct buying versus heavily bargained premium rates and a team that helps you to process the claims for corporate provided one. Want to have a comparative study and which one is the best? Patu, over to you. I think the answer is quite simple. Unless you have a rock solid tenured uh, secure job uh, where you know when you're going to retire and the uh, those retirement health uh, benefits are also, you know, health insurance benefits uh, are also part of your, you know, package. Then and only then uh, does a corporate group insurance policy make sense. So typically for government jobs, for those in the PSUs, uh, only for them, a corporate cover alone makes sense. If, assuming it is a comprehensive one. There are many corporate covers which are not. So we are, they have to be careful there. For all others, for freelancers, for people who are working in a corporate environment, they can be sent home any day. Mm. So uh, a corporate cover will immediately cease and they'll be uh, left alone with no cover uh, to fend for themselves. At that point, if they want to buy a, a health insurance policy, they may have got some lifestyle disease, the premium would be higher, uh, there could be some pre-existing conditions, the health insurers would say, you're not insurable anymore. So the the best solution is to have both get yourself uh, a corporate cover opt for it of course it's not optional in many cases you are but many people don't know the terms and conditions of a corporate policy that is something i see in, in my meetings they just don't know unless they you know have a need to use it they don't understand what it is so my suggestion is go to your hr 
get a booklet that says that these are the terms and conditions for the health insurance they will also have for life insurance find out what you're eligible for what are your rights for a corporate cover and that would be your first layer of protection uh, because uh, it's easier to claim because the health insurance company wouldn't want to antagonize the hr of any uh, company because even though you are not eligible for a claim for some reason they will push the claim forward because they will lose the entire business because if many employees go and complain to the HR saying this group insurer should be changed next year because group insurance is a yearly contract. They should be changed, then the HR would change it and they would lose that business. So it's easier for them to you know pay that pittance of a few lakhs for you and uh, look in terms of the crores for the uh, group package. So that will be your first layer of uh, security. A private policy which you purchase for your family uh, it can be, of course, it's expensive these days, but you can buy a, a small cover when you're young. You buy a small cover and then as your uh, salary increases over time, you can gradually increase it. That's what I did. And uh, I've now been able to have a substantial private cover for myself. But So, so you should have both uh, in case you lose your job and uh, you're not going to be able to you know, uh, fend for yourself without health insurance. Now, as regards... Uh, no, no claim benefits, etc. My suggestion is please don't worry about it because uh, those are just uh, tidbits uh, of just for window shopping. They're given to you just the decorative things. They're not the core uh, uh, properties of the policy. If you shouldn't be misguided by them, they just say, you know, uh, there's a rolling out the red carpet for you to come uh, look at that. And, you know, those are the freebies that people want you to focus on. They are all unimportant. And uh, tip, I mean, the kind of features that the uh, uh, cover has will vary from one insurer to the other. Some will have a no claim bonus. That is, uh, they will uh, give you a discount sometimes if you have a no, uh, if you did not have claim the last year. Some of them will add uh, the, bo uh, the bonus, they will add a small extra amount to the sum insured if you did not have a, a claim in the previous year. And so on, there are different types of these. Uh, you know, freebies or uh, offering just to have continuity. They, they want you to keep paying premiums. That's all. That's an incentive for the insurer, not for us. All those incentives will vanish the moment we have a claim. Hmm. So you, you for 10 years, you never had a claim. So you had all these bonuses. The 11th year, you made a claim. When you pay the premium for the 12th year, it's a complete reset. Everything will vanish. So it is not something that you should really bank upon. Those That's not important. And uh, as regards claim processing, one of the most important ways in which to sell insurance is to say, look, you buy the policy through me and I'll help you make the claims. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, to some extent, that's true. There are some advisors who help, but it is our responsibility as a buyer to understand how to make a claim. When to approach the insurer. So there are two kinds of hospitalizations. Emergency hospitalizations, unplanned hospitalizations and planned, uh, you know, surgical procedures typically. And so for each of them, the claim process is slightly different. You have to intimate the insurer how you are going to do it and so on. And even if you don't have anybody uh, as an advisor to help you with, all you need is the medical insurance health card that they, the, car, the kind of ID card that they give you. You go to a, a network hospital, show the card, and it's a very simple process. And, and as long as you've been upfront in uh, declaring all your health conditions truly at the time of buying, there's really nothing to worry about. I mean, you, you have to fill a couple of forms and, and it's just paperwork. It's, uh, paperwork never killed anybody. I mean, there's a lot of complaining about paperwork, but it never killed anybody. So I, I think it, you shouldn't worry too much about somebody helping you for claim processing and so on. It's not rocket science at all. Great. Two or three questions that keep popping up in my mind as you said that. Right at the start, you mentioned if you have a very secure tenure job, do you want to name some industries where you think this could apply? Because I guess in this day and age, there's just so much of insecurity about jobs, et cetera, et cetera, which basically is pushing you towards what Patu said to make sure you have your own insurance apart from your group cover. But any particular industries or situations, perhaps such as yourself, where you're you know, in an IIT as a professor, right? What are some other places where you think, yes, this is a secure job and can last you for most of your career? See, all civil servants. 
anybody who works for the government in any capacity in whatever area they have some kind of security right even if they are asked to quit the job they will still as a um, ex employee they will still have benefits even yeah. if uh, people who retire they still have uh, there are unions associations where they can be part of something called as central government health scheme and so on so there are many uh, you know benefits for them but for th- if those in a corporate setup where your next month salary depends on the profitability of somebody else of the company anything can happen i mean uh, and I, there are i know situations where uh, there was a two week gap between one employment and the other and with in between there was a hospitalization and uh, the new employer said you are not technically part of our uh, team you are not formally an employee so we can't pay you we can't add you to the group cover so you never know so it's better to start small i mean everybody is worried about health insurance because two things one it's expensive it's becoming expensive uh, every day and the two is the selection process who do i go with we talked about uh, broad guidelines for selection in our uh, episodes so that's why i said small start small and then build it up over time so you build a relationship with that company over time and things become easier as your salary increases i don't know if this is a question worth asking but from the perspective of the insurance company do they earn more money in these group policies with large companies absolutely definitely much more than us as private uh, absolutely individual. yeah it, yeah it's that's pittance retail is pittance and does the even if you have a, a private insurance medical insurance cover does say if you claim it 3 years in a row does that affect your policy in any way or that's the company's headache and not your headache see um earlier it used to a I few see. years ago if you have uh, if you claimed the next year your premium will increase uh but then irda said that you shouldn't do that claim based uh loading of the premium uh, should not be there but then i mean uh, corporates always find a way so what they do is they will hike the premium up front taking into account that this guy will claim every you know 5 years or 6 years or so or there are situations where they will uh, they will say up front that look this is the initial uh, claim a uh, premium uh, sorry premium and then that premium will hike ev- be hiked every year so they have found a way to you know find uh, but in principle just because you have a, a bad claim history that uh, that should not be the reason for a uh, premium hike however the insurer can say you have 10 lakhs and you say i want to hike it to 15 lakhs the insurer say sorry uh, you are bad for us we, are, we you just can't hike the uh, sum insured the sum insured for you will stay at 10 lakhs that they can do sure i hope that answered your question namah shivayam uh, please keep messaging and keep emailing us if that did not answer your question and we'll keep asking these questions to pattu um siddharth kotkar wants to ask what insurance cover you have pattu which company and which particular policy so um i got my insurance from united india uh in 2006 that is the time when my father got hospitalized without any insurance that's when i realized the money draining away from me so i ran and got health insurance for myself my mother and my wife the same we have the same cover uh, of course is it that, one cover like a family plan so it is um it is a mix of both it is a family cover but it is individual covers it's not a floater policy so each of us have a, at that time i think it was a couple of lakhs so we have i've gradually enhanced that sum and uh, today we have a, a individual cover for 25 lakhs each oh wow uh, on top of that uh, i also purchased a super top up insurance and that has got a threshold of uh, sorry a deductible of 5 lakhs i think if i remember right and uh, initially it was 15 lakhs the sum insured was 15 lakhs with a 5 lakh deductible and then united india enhanced its um, term ins- uh, sum insured limits uh, then i it introduced a 99 lakh cover so i have enhanced it to 99 lakh so this super top up is uh, a separate cover for my mother and a floater cover for my uh, family that is uh, me wife and son so that's it on top of it a couple of years ago i also bought inexpensive covers from future generally and uh, liberty insurance for my wife and son i i could not be insured these privates will not take me on 
because I have an autoimmune condition, they will uh, say no to that. So this is an inexpensive cover. I don't remember the, uh, the limits, but I just bought, I mean, because United India, remember we talked about room rent sublimits. Yes. United India had that for several years. Right. And because of that, I didn't want them to suffer. So I thought I'll get a private cover for them. I got that through a friend uh, who distributes insurance and I, I know his uh, him for his competence. I've talked about all this in the in the blogs and the, episode, yeah. in the uh, yeah uh, yeah in the also in my articles so after that thankfully united india lifted that uh, room rent sub limits for their family cover so they now they say they will pay all charges for a single ac room right so that's okay and so of that's course this, this costs a ton all these costs quite a bit Will of money. Will you be comfortable sharing how much so that the listeners have benchmarks? A lakh or should and above. we not? A lakh wow. and above. But, this but is for the entire family? Everybody. Everybody. So, but that's a lot. But, but it's reasonable. But it's a 25 lakh cover, right? And also, the main cost is half of that cost is because of my mother. My mother is yes. now 76. And uh, 76, giving her... Uh, uh, 6 lakh. She only has a 6 lakh base cover. Even for that 6 lakh at 76 years, costs a ton of money. Almost half of it goes there. But I got a little confused at the start of your answer, Patu, about a family floater versus a family with individual cover. I didn't even know this yeah. second category exists. Can you tell us a little so more it, about that? Because uh, I only it, have a floater. Yeah. So, in an individual thing, I am the proposer of for the family. So, the insurer uh, insurance will be in my name. But under me, there are people, which includes, of course, me, my wife, and my son. Each of them have their own individual limit, insurance limit. So it's not it's not a floater. It's not shared. Right? It's not shared among the family. They are individual, but still, I will be the proposer for that family. I think. I mean, I don't know if there's a name to. Uh, I don't know. I mean, United India has calls it Medicare. If I'm not wrong, but I don't know what the other uh, other people call it. It's is there an advantage insurance. over a floater cover? Because I personally have a floater. Um, so I've talked about this with, uh, I used to think it was an advantage, but I mean, I talked about it with somebody who, who, more knowledgeable than me and, in, and they said, look, if you can afford a 25 lakh, 30, 30 lakh floater for your family, I think you're okay. That's exactly the amount I have a 25 lakh cover uh, for the I family think, as a floater. I, I think that's fine. And then there are options for uh, top-ups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I got a little worried because Rajesh from our team has a 25 lakh cover just for himself. So am I under-insured for my family is my no, key question. No, I, I, I think, see, insurance is a game of probability. Hmm. And I think… Uh, Touch what we haven't claimed it even once. Uh, it's a game of probability. I think you should take… You can take a chance saying, look, uh, over 25 lakhs, maybe a couple of claims for the family over a year, we can manage. Yeah. So I think it's okay. It's, it's a reasonable uh, chance to take. Fair enough. All right. Thank you for that, Patu. I'm going to try and find our next insurance question. Um, it's from Ranga Rao Thotakura 4059. After having a policy for two years, if we declare a condition for the third year, will the waiting period exist for that mentioned condition from that point on? Fantastic question. Uh, it's a, and I had for, I have first hand uh, knowledge, I mean, experience with this, sorry. Uh, so the waiting, so let's say you have a cover for 5 lakhs and sure. you had it for uh, four years and then uh, you made a claim um, and so on, etc. Doesn't matter. Uh, and the sixth year, or uh, you enhance it to 10 lakhs. So, if this policy had a waiting period of, let's say, two years for any pre-existing condition, the additional 5 lakh that you have purchased, that will have that waiting period of two, two years. It's like a fresh policy from day one. For the additional sum yes. insured. Yes. The, the initially purchased 5 lakhs will continue because that waiting period is over for that. So, so if you have made a claim... Uh, for some condition and you still have that condition in the first five years. So that condition will be excluded for the first two years. So for, for any hospitalization due to that condition, your effective cover will still be 5 lakhs for two years. And after that, it will become 10 lakhs. Does that make, does that make it, sense? Yeah, perfect answer. And that gives me so much of insight. But to push you a little bit, Patu, there are two ways an insurance company can know about your condition. If you claim for some treatment... Or if you voluntarily announce that you have this condition. Um, 
So you're saying even if this person has had this insurance cover, he's finished with his waiting period for pre-existing conditions because he's in his third year. Now he's announced something in his third year. Um, what happens to... Is is only that condition excluded from that point on for another two years or... See, um, technically, uh, insurers have become smart these days. So when you renew, they will ask, have you got anything new? Whether you're going to renew for the same cover or an enhanced cover, they're going to ask. When they ask, you're obligated to tell the truth. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's no other way around it. However, they cannot do anything. They cannot change the terms of your policy if you're not going to increase it, uh, uh, you know, your cover. Just because, let's say I've become diabetic uh, and I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, renew my uh, policy. They, I, uh, If they ask me, have you got anything new? I'll say I've become diabetic, but they have to offer the cover uh, for the same 5 lakhs. However, if I say I have had this 5 lakh, make it 10 lakhs, they will either lower the premium because you now have the condition or they will say, uh, sorry, we can't insure you or worse, they can say, uh, we will cover you for 10 lakhs for any hospitalization, excluding diabetes. Which is which puts you in trouble because uh, that will also affect the initial five lakhs. So you have to be careful. It's crazy, and then they can also claim any kind of hospitalization. It was because of that diabetes, right? Because diabetes causes so many. See, this is where most of the court cases or the ombudsman case files. If you look at it, they were all because of this. Mm. They will say pre-existing, pre-existing, and uh, I mean, I've had ex uh, examples uh, from my friend uh, Deepak Menderata, who I got uh, the insurance from. He runs a uh, website called Plan Cover. Of course, mo his main business is not that, but he still does it, does the re retail insurance. So he he tells me that let's say uh, you go to a, a doctor for you know uh, due to a hospitalization, and you say, uh, doctor, it's, uh, I I have had a bad knee for the last uh, two, three four years, and the doctor writes it in the discharge summary. He will write right. He's obligated to write everything. The insurer will say you got the policy from us one year ago. You did not disclose that you had a bad knee. Wow. Even if the hospitalization has nothing to do with a bad knee, your claim can be denied because you have not been truthful. That doesn't even begin to sound fair, Patu. How does one fight this? It is, see, you, 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 if you know you have something wrong with you, even if you are not taking medication for it, it's better to disclose. That is the only, honesty is the only way out. You disclose anything. You say, I have colds. I get, I got a cold last month. I mean, it's irrelevant to the risk uh, profiling. But still you say it. It's not going to hurt you. That is where we have to be careful with all these agents. What they'll do is for, to meet their targets. They will say, uh, it's okay, chalega, don't, don't bother. Don't nil, nil, it. nil, no pre this condition. And they will say, put the dot and say, sign here. That's it. They would have, that is why we have to do the paperwork. And that's why I say, it's okay to buy through distributors, but you tell them, I want this policy with these conditions. Do up the paperwork. I will fill and sign. You don't go and tell them, Please tell me what policy should I buy? That is the dumbest thing. It's like, you know, asking a barber if you want a haircut like uh, Warren Buffett said. So that's where we have to be careful. Our awareness is important. It, doesn't it feel like this entire episode is on medical insurance? What to? <laughs> <laughs> and I take uh, blame for that. I've kept pushing you. One no, final so question bad. on medical insurance. This is from Shubham Vinayak. Uh, Shubham, you've asked many questions, as many as nine questions. The team has noted it down. But I'm going to pick on one particular question. Is there group medical insurance outside of private companies, like group insurance for the whole society or some similar-minded people coming together for group medical insurance? Would be very helpful if Patu Sir can answer these questions. And before I open it up to you, Patu, it's a fantastic question. What if I wanted to get a group insurance cover for my football team or for my housing society? How does this work? So, uh, first of all, I, uh, the, all the other questions asked by Shubham, they're good. And I, I will, I'm planning to write an article on this as an FAQ. So they will get answered in the article form. Uh, at some point in time, I'll publish it. Uh, so this thing, so the rules are very clear about this. They say that you cannot come together and form an association or society or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, only for the, uh, you know, for getting a term, a uh, group cover, sorry, any, any group insurance. 
uh, if that is your motive then it's illegal they will not correct. right if you had already existed as a society and you say i've been there for 5 years i've done that yes it's possible to get a group cover however it is very dangerous those covers are very dangerous because in those kinds of associations societies and so on uh, everybody is more or less an equal member and uh, there will be there will be infighting of some kind there will be some kinds of tensions brewing they will suddenly say uh, they uh, you know they will change the group insurance uh, policy every year because it's very important to understand uh, group insurance is only for one year right it is the, uh, it, the next year it's an entirely new cover so you are buying a the management is buying a new policy for you every year hmm. uh, whereas in a uh, individual policy there is a history and that history continues uh, your history of waiting periods your pre existing conditions that will all be taken into account the uh, no claim benefits etc etc they will they will continue there's a there's a you know um, yeah so it continues so that's not possible in a in a group insurance policy and your if your management changes they can buy it from somebody else with a very different set of conditions and group insurance covers are becoming more and more expensive these days because they know that the buyers are misusing it they got, they get it they can get all kinds of uh, you know illnesses maybe the not even uh, deserving claims but uh, so they made it more uh, difficult to get earlier they used to say uh, pre existing conditions doesn't matter there is no waiting period for pre existing conditions and that they got that at a nominal price but because lot of sick people joined the group and they started claiming they now have hiked the premiums so it is no longer inexpensive and group insurance matters only i mean makes sense only when you have thousands of people in your group right that that's when the price will come down to something very very if you just have 20 people 30 people 40 people it's, it's re- and they probably the company won't even take you on interesting they, they will say uh, i will send you a guy we will have a camp in your society and uh, you we will sign up sign you up for uh, you know individual covers after a presentation and they will give you some coffee whatever and mug whatever and that's how it's done so it's i think it's it's very dangerous to go for that on also bank uh, policies there are many uh, tie ups between insurers and banks of course m- many of those tie ups have dissolved only very few exist but again so what happens is anybody who has an account is eligible for health cover but the problem is you get all sorts of sick people in the insured pool if there are a lot of sick people the insurers are going to uh, punish the a uh, healthy ones as well yeah we talked about that in the so i think it's it's a i think even if you're eligible for such group policies outside of your um, employment you should avoid them i think that answers my football team question also i think we're a small <laughs> group it's only 25 to 30 of us that are allowed to register themselves in the team and secondly um uh, because we play football there's a high chance of injury so they probably say either no or be super expensive so I I guess I have my answer. All right, medical insurance questions done for this particular week. Let's move on to but to perhaps we can go to real estate because that's also seems like a very hot topic on let's get rich with Pattu. From Ritesh Kumar, "Hi sir, I have invested 40 to 50% of the house price. Is it a good idea to take out that amount and pay it as a down payment or take the max loan amount possible keeping the investment intact?" paying more of emis and hence lesser investments thereafter till the loan is repaid in brackets assuming already saved investments give 10 to 12% returns versus the house loan at 8.5% phenomenal ans a question but to over to you so i would uh, there are many people out there who compare the housing loan returns with portfolio returns etc i think you shouldn't do that um i think the ideal uh, mix for your salary so we talked about retirement and we said uh, if x are your expenses the ideal investment for for retirement is 75 to 100% of x but unfortunately that assumes there are no home loans right there are no emis 
And no kids. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it should still be the case even if you have kids. But yeah, it's tough for many people to get there. But definitely, it's almost impossible for those with kids and EMIs. Mm. So, uh, the ideal mix for those who, who are bent on getting themselves a house is, I would say, is out of your take-home pay. That is, after the tax, after the mandatory EPF, NPS kind of retirement deductions, whatever you're taking home, out of that, 30% expenses, 30% EMI, maybe 40%, and 30% or 20% investments, with about 10% buffer for emergencies. This is the ideal mix that you can somehow manage. If your EMI crosses 40% of your take home, you are in trouble. Mm. It will really start uh, making things like very difficult for you. Life will be very difficult. Any extra expenditure, your kids want something extra, you have to send, send them to some extra class, you have a, a emergency or an unexpected recurring expense, you are in soup. So, your current day experience becomes very tough. Yes. So that's not... Uh, worth it. So I think there should be a balance between uh, or among investments, expenses, EMI. So automatically there should therefore be a balance between the down payment and the EMI as well. So you should have the down payment, enough down payment accumulated so that your EMI ideally does not cross 30% or at best 40%, not more than that. 35 is some kind of, uh, you know, median uh, agreement. But so there should be that balance. So once, so you should accumulate for that down payment until you are able to achieve this balance. Right. And obviously the other thing is people should do a retirement uh, planning calculation. I, we talked about this in the true cost of uh, buying a house. That the moment you do a retirement planning calculation, many people are going to think twice, at least some will think twice about, uh, you know, buying a house, but you should balance it. If you say, no, buying is very important for me, you should somehow still manage your long-term goals, retirement, children's future, etc. with your EMIs. As long as you hit that balance, I think it's fine. Re uh, return comparisons don't matter. I think that's a great thumb rule, a great benchmark. But I guess the only unknown part of uh, Ritesh's question is, is this 40% or 50% that he's invested is it a separate fund for the house or is it the overall fund, right? What, <laughs> That's a what problem. if it is either or? How does that change? I didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> it is a big problem. If you are saying that's your net worth, then it's you're in trouble. Yeah. That Has he mentioned his age? I can check his... Uh, Ritesh Kumar, no, he hasn't, sir. No, he hasn't. So if he's young, he probably can get away with it. If he's on the leave, is less than maybe 35. But he's older and uh, I think he's in trouble. I think you should not do that. You should not. You should, uh, uh, but the pro I think you should probably delay even buying the house. That is the better uh, solution. Many, most people won't agree with me, but yeah. But I think the great benchmark was if it is around 30, max 40% of your take-home pay and you, you know, you can back calculate and decide how much of a down payment Ideally, banks cannot, should not offer you a loan if it's more than 40%. Ideally. But uh, oh. bankers are known to make all sorts of things. But if what, they say... Is this a government mandated rule? No, 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 no. I, I mean, uh, it's the health uh, of the bank, right? They can't... Uh, uh, yeah, I guess, yeah. So, uh, but uh, so they will say, they, uh, there's a couple, we have a couple, we are a couple, she's working, I'm working, yeah. we'll have a joint home loan and so on. Then things become a little bit... But whatever it is, when I say take home, it is a take home of the family, all the breadwinners. So it, it shouldn't exceed 40%. Great. Going on to a very completely different topic and I love this question. It's from Pankaj Podar. Thank you so much for it, Pankaj. Uh, most people will do mistakes or will not know their average monthly expenses. That can only be calculated accurately after noting it down for three to four years on a monthly basis under specific expenditure heads such as main, cooking gas, vegetables, medicals, etc. etc. He's given a few headers and filtering it carefully and taking average of it after at least three or four years. As certain expenses have long cycles, such as changing battery of your inverter, changing appliance like fridge, etc. It's, it's a great question, but I don't think we've ever deep dived into how to track expenses. 
and it's not something i do very diligently or very accurately i think i know because i know right but it that's never good enough and everything is based on these monthly expenses how you invest for your future etc etc so what do you recommend i would see there are many people who love tracking there are many people who are, who are on these uh, apps you know tracking apps on their phones and so on they love tracking if you love tracking please do it obviously it is data and data is never going to hurt it's going to give you insights uh, but if you are one of those guys who know i i don't care about the nitty gritty then i would say look at the balance what do you mean by that patu look at the uh, look at the balance before you got the salary or before you got your it's harder for freelancers because they're going to get trickles of payments and so on it's it's very hard for freelancers but at least for the salaried people there's some chunk that hits your bank account within the fifth of regular yeah regularly so you know find out the balance that was there before before it hit and find out the cash in hand that gives you an idea of what you did and if you had uh, obviously you you would easy to find out the savings the saving or investing is very easy to figure out so you can just uh, you know add that to the balance and then you know that's your expense that's your total expense mm. so it's easy to find the total expense every month instead of writing down everything how much on petrol how much on groceries and so on yeah it can be done and if you are passionate about it and i know many people who are and i have got many insights from now i know a guy who has been doing this for decades and he sent me uh, the data it, it tells you how inflation you know grows oh fascinating In, if you are if you are one for tracking go ahead and track if you are not one for tracking the simplest is look at the balance before your salary hits find out how much you saved add it to the balance then salary minus that amount is what you spent hmm. and that you can keep track you don't even need to track it every month find out what it is every quarter or every 6 months do that exercise every 6 months that is enough it gives you some some number so my point is when you enter that number in your retirement planning calculation it should not be an underestimate exactly that's what worries me the most part too i have a rough number but i'm worried that that rough number is going to really bite me going forward right because i've not maybe i've underestimated or I've, if i've overestimated amazing but the point is if i've underestimated does even small values then accumulate oh, build up so okay because you because see the the most important aspect of retirement planning or any financial goal planning is you should do it once a year you should redo the entire thing with fresh inputs because today your expenses are these next year because of good or bad things you may have you may become a, a, a father of two and then your expenses are going to be higher so you have to you have to uh, review the inputs every year and that's always going to take care of all these you know changes that happen there you go pankaj i hope that's been answered properly moving on to a question that we've made anonymous on the request of this person who sent this in and uh, a, really made us sit back and think i'm going to read it out just started to follow patu sir recently and started hearing the new podcast on your channel it's amazing new things to understand in finance thanks for doing it thank you uh, whoever's written this in i wanted to ask how to manage finances and had some queries i'm 29 years old and the only breadwinner with home loan and i'm also single eyed i lost my right eye vision recently 3 months back also a cancer survivor happened in 2019 no major corpus i have made not eligible for term insurance and this broke my heart and but we'll probably delve on this a little bit any inputs for financial planning or you plan to discuss on podcast would be great so, yeah so that's that's really tough uh so kudos to the person for you know uh, being a positive about things i think uh i think he would probably not be eligible for health insurance as well or at least not eligible for future hikes if he has one before the a uh, cancer episode he probably has something but it's better to assume effectively because of inflation and so on there is no insurance of any kind so what do you do well the one good thing is age is on his side 29 is still not too late to start investing i think the the basic rules are still the same nothing has changed try to invest 75 to 100% of x your monthly expenses for retirement and or if that's less well invest what you can that's the uh general everything boils down to that invest what you can but invest it in a 
portfolio of 50% stocks and 50% fixed income. But before you do that, if you have some net worth to speak of now, you treat that net worth as your emergency fund. Nice. Whatever you have accumulated so far, it can be little, but let it be little. That's fine. But that's going to be your emergency fund. From the next month, whatever you're going to invest, you invest it and in, try to align it in this kind of portfolio. Now that will be your future wealth. Of course, you need a lot of luck, uh, you know, to make sure you don't get too big hospitalized, hospitalized again, etc., etc. But that is okay. That's that those kind of risks are there for everybody. Maybe it's a little higher for you, but you can't do much about it. I mean, this is the uh, only thing. You have some base as an emergency, and then you start investing and building wealth. I hope that gives you a little bit of. Uh direction and hope from Pattu. But Pattu, I must push you a little bit. It just breaks my heart to hear he's not eligible even for term insurance. And what is the logic behind that? He's willing to pay a premium. He's just lost an eye. It does not mean life is at risk. Uh, it depends. I mean, uh, the insurer will argue that because he has only one eye, uh, maybe things are difficult for him. Uh, you know, there can be situations where he can get himself into trouble walking on the road or things like that. And also the cancer issue makes it even worse. Uh, right. Assuming they're independent of each other, uh, then that makes it worse. So they will say there's a high risk of uh, immediate mortality. And uh, the, so in insur it's, it's high risk for an insurer. So they won't do it. It's in, uh, health, Both health and I would say, I, would, I will not be surprised if he does not have any health insurance or uh, as I said, they won't give him higher, higher uh, some insurance. But hang in there, I guess that would be uh, our, our motto. Keep listening to us, keep writing in. And if you have any particular minor questions as well, but would be thrilled to answer them. And our last question for this episode, uh, and thank you for being with us until this moment. I have to get used to saying this. Please like, share and subscribe to our page on YouTube. Please share the word and get other people to listen to this podcast. It's a community we're trying to build of absolutely no-nonsense financial independence advice. Coming from, coming from Pattu, you can't get better than that. Our last question for today, Pattu. Do you have any advice for a 45 plus guy who has just started investing in 2021 and he's just started watching us on YouTube? I think he represents a very large audience, Pattu, um, who for whatever reason have been busy with their lives and have not thought about investing. How do you start at this late day and age and I'm sure it will help a number of listeners listening. So I think you just take one step at a time. And you don't worry about uh, what the time elapsed. Because regret is a big, uh, it's, it's such a wasteful emotion. It doesn't get anything done. Particularly in money management, people are always regretting. Uh, one guy said, I I'm 25 and I regret not starting early. And people pounced on him. Say, what are you doing? <laughs> Just 25. So I, there's always, I mean, we all have regrets, but we still, you know, soldier on. So I would say, look, what's gone, uh, what time, or what's happened has happened and you are going to start. But you do not have the time to learn things and you don't have the time to live and learn. You must get started in the right direction from day one so that whatever... Uh, remaining time is there between now and your intended retirement. Maybe you may have to extend it. It depends. But I would suggest go talk to a fee-only SEBI registered investment advisors. So uh, I have a list of those curated advisors. That uh, list is more than 10 years old uh, on my website, freefincal.com. Or you can search for feeonlyindia.com. That's a list of uh, advisors. I am a patron. Uh, founder member of that uh, group. So these are people who will advise you without any kind of commissions. They get money from only you and they work only for you. So there's no conflict of interest involved. So uh, even if it's a little expensive, so th they can be 15,000, 20,000, 25,000. I would say think of it as an investment for peace of mind in the future years. And uh, they will help you understand where you are today and what you need to be uh, to uh, to uh, to achieve your goals partially or maybe fully they, they if you cannot achieve your goals fully they will tell you how to adjust the inputs maybe you have to expect less income after retirement maybe you have to uh, extend your retirement by a couple of years etc 
but those kind of uh, discussions have to be done by a professional because it's not a um, simple thing to do over this kind of medium. So please get professional advice from the sources that I just mentioned because there are a lot of other sources out there uh, with a lot of conflict of interest and they'll charge, they may even charge you a percentage of your uh, assets that you have and so on. So uh, once you get this guidance, you will feel so much more confident that you can uh, do something for with the remainder of the time that uh, you are you can you're going to be employed fantastic advice but to uh, this fee of 15 20 30000 that they charge you is that a yearly charge does it go down at any point how does this work for fee only advisors is there any light you can throw on that so yeah so the the range is quite huge uh, so some of them charge a lot more so you, but i mean you can always pick and choose who you would like to work with and typically so let's say it's 20000 for the first year of engagement so in that engagement you have they will ask you they will give you an input uh, data sheet you have to give all your things your in investments what your goals are etc and they will come up with a financial plan and they will tell you what to do how to implement the plan they will not implement the plan for you you will have to do it but they'll tell you they'll give you some advice on how to do it where to do it etc and uh, some of them review after six months but typically the review period is one year and that's more than enough. So after the, uh, so that 20, 20K fee is for one year. After that, the fee typically drops to half. Nice. See? It typically drops to half and then it's that's a continued engagement. And there are many people who have said, uh, thank you for educating me. I don't need you anymore. I'm going to do, I, uh, do a DIY on my own. They are very happy with that engagement, uh, that arrangement, and that's absolutely because they've so, done their job brilliantly. Yes, so that's and maybe you can go five years later and just reassess. You know, so they do that as options well. are many. Yeah, great. On that positive note, and I'll add a couple of points. Even if you're 45, just invest in your health, invest in your relationships, maybe find other skills and taps you can turn on so that you know income can continue past your years. And freelancers are very good at doing that. Even if you're in a job. Uh, and you see that you're going to retire at 58 and you're 45 right now, I'm sure you can figure it out and just keep listening, keep asking pointed questions and all the very best. Patu, thank you so much for your time. I think it's been one of my most enjoyable episodes answering so many different varied topics. I hope you can do keep doing more of it if the viewers and listeners keep writing in. Any last thoughts and please extol them to keep doing that. So yeah, uh, I, it's wonderful to always answer questions and I'm honored that so many people want to no answers from us and so please uh, always keep writing uh, commenting on the youtube or maybe write to us write to the offspin uh, email and uh, tell them what is it that you want you can also think about coming on the show there are ways to do it you can reach out to them and they'll help you so we look forward to hearing more from you have a great week see you next week on let's get rich with patto bye bye bye